Welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Tamar Friedman. On behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I want to welcome you to today's important webinar on the subject of supporting Israeli nonprofits during COVID-19 with a special focus on loan funds. We have a very full panel and a lot of important information to share. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Andre Spaconi, the CEO and president of Jewish Funders Network to give, to, to give more of a, a foundation of what we're gonna talk about and to discuss more of the issues that we're seeing in Israeli nonprofits. And, and so to you, Andres, thank you so much. Thank you, Tamar, and, and welcome everybody. And I hope everybody is safe and, and healthy in these in this trying times. Um, and using the uh, and, and surviving uh, these times of social isolation as best as you can. Um, those that are having a lot of trouble surviving these times are many Israeli nonprofits. And Israeli nonprofits, uh, as we as we discussed in a previous webinar a couple of years, a couple of weeks ago, it feels like a couple of years ago, but it was just a couple of weeks ago, uh, they are actually confronting a what we call a double whammy of you know, having come from a year in which there was no government in Israel and therefore no budget. And, and um, Sagi will correct me later, but Israeli nonprofits depend heavily, I think it's 48% of the budget uh, from uh, on, on government funding. So you can imagine that having, having no government budget, it's a very, it's a very, very big problem for, for those nonprofits. Um, and on top of that, the coronavirus crisis hit, and now we have a perfect storm for literally thousands of, of nonprofits in the state of Israel um, who, who, who are being hit from many different sides. Um, one of the solutions that communities in the United States are, are, are working with is the solution of bridge loans. And I'm very happy that in Israel now we have that possibility too, offering bridge loans to nonprofits to help them navigate these this this, this tough times. Of course, this is just one intervention. You know, many nonprofits will need grants and many nonprofits will need major restructuring and mergers and all the things that we're discussing for nonprofits in the US as well. But for a, for a large segment of the nonprofit uh, ecosystem in the state of Israel, bridge loans can be a, a life raft that takes them through the, through the crisis. So uh, this is what we're going to be discussing in this, in this webinar today. Uh, we're joined by an amazing panel of, of, of uh, practitioners and leaders and um, and I'm gonna be giving the floor to them in a second. I would also say that uh, for, for those of you um, uh, among the participants, Jeff and is here to help you. Um, if you know of philanthropic responses, if you wanna discuss needs with us, if you have ideas for webinars like this one about other topics, um, we're always happy to hear and we're here to assist you during, during this crisis and make your philanthropy better and more powerful as we all navigate these uncharted waters of COVID-19. So without further ado and to just plunge directly into the topic, I'm going to give the floor to uh, my friend and colleague Misha Galperin, who is the uh, philanthropic advisor of the Gottesman Foundation who is one of the big philanthropic champions of the, of the loan fund that we're gonna be discussing. Misha, over to you. Uh, thank you, Andres. Um, um, good afternoon, uh, everyone, or good morning, wherever where you are. Uh, good time of day. Again, I wanna echo uh, Andres's words about hope that everyone is uh, safe and well and getting through this as best as possible. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, Andres uh, and uh, Maya Natan, who is the uh, head of the JFM Israel, 
um, because it's, it's actually their publication initially on the issue of the non-for-profits uh, situation in Israel during COVID crisis that um, attracted my attention. And uh, uh, one of my philanthropic clients, uh, Bob Gottesman, who's been involved uh, for a number of years with Israel Free Loan Association, which then became uh, the Ogan Group, um, had uh, uh, come up with, with an idea uh, to uh, adopt what uh, um, what was happening in, in the um, impact loan uh, uh, arena in, in Israel to this crisis and to um, uh, come up with a, an urgent response uh, to try to deal with this. Uh, let me just uh, say a little bit about how we're going to do this uh, uh, webinar um, and then um, begin to... Uh, uh, delve into the into the substance. Uh, we're going to start out with a short uh, background piece and presentation from uh, Beth Searle, who is the uh, president and CEO of the largest independent Jewish community foundation in the United States, that in San Diego. In addition to her position now um, over the last three years, um, for 20 years prior to that, Beth uh, is one of the leaders um, in the impact investment field and so she'll give us um, and continues to be that and worked very much in that field and came to uh, her current position with an idea of getting um, Jewish communities and Jewish organizations uh, more involved uh, in this arena. So Beth will uh, start us off with uh, um, a background on impact investing um, and on impact loans uh, in particular. Uh, we'll then turn it over to uh, my friend and longtime colleague, uh, the first uh, uh, female CEO of uh, the Jewish Agency for Israel, uh, Amira Aronovitz, who, uh, as I can see, is sitting in the car, which uh, um, is a sign that things are getting a little uh, more relaxed in Israel. Um, not that uh, she's been relaxed. She's been working very, very hard, and Amira was head of strategy, uh, at the Jewish Agency and um, has been uh, the CEO for almost a year now, I think, and although it must seem like about a hundred, uh, given everything that's happened. Um, um, the Jewish Agency is working uh, very much in concert with uh, um, the Ogan Group, which is the uh, loan uh, association uh, non-profit loan association in Israel, which is about to become Israel's first digital social bank. Um, and uh, my friend Sagi Balasha, who is uh, uh, who uh, also is in his office in Israel, unlike the rest of us uh, sitting at home, um, will then uh, take over from Amira and talk about the specifics uh, of the program. Um, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, uh, another friend, Ruth Saltzman, who is the CEO of the um, Russell Berry Foundation um, here in, in New Jersey, uh, and who's made a very significant investment lately in this uh, arena, will uh, take over and uh, talk about why um, her particular uh, foundation chose to um, uh, participate in this program, and then we'll uh, hopefully have room for questions about the particulars um, of this uh, uh, project, which has to do with helping the Israeli Amutot. Just a couple of words about uh, um, the issue to elaborate on what uh, Andres was uh, was saying to us in the beginning. Um, uh, indeed, 49% of all revenue for uh, Israeli nonprofits comes from government. Uh, now, if you eliminate some of the larger, more well-known nonprofits that get a lot of philanthropic money and a lot of earned revenue, places like universities, hospitals, uh, etc., the numbers are actually significantly higher. Most most uh, amutot in Israel are more or less like at sixty or seventy percent um, in government funding. Uh, the uh, problem uh, has always been. Uh, that government uh, funding comes on a reimbursement basis. So first you have to spend the money, um, then you have to submit your um, 
expenditures to the government. And, you know, uh, if uh, in 30 days uh, or 60 days or 90 days, uh, you're lucky enough, you'll get uh, your uh, reimbursement on the money you've already spent on a government contract. Um, uh, so working capital has always been a significant issue, and that's one of the reasons why uh, Ogan um, had a program uh, uh, that they've instituted to lend uh, bridge capital or, or um, uh, working capital uh, to Israeli nonprofits um, backed by the government contracts that the nonprofits had. Uh, and as Andres mentioned, with the government in Israel being essentially in um, uh, uh, paralysis uh, over the last uh, year, it's become still more difficult to get the money from the government and the nonprofits, even those that had solid contracts had a hard time getting getting their um, getting their reimbursements. Now, COVID-19 came on top of that, um, and uh, uh, other sources of revenue have dried up, as, as they have in the United States, and things have become uh, even more difficult. So it's uh, in response to, to this that an emergency program was, was developed using the concepts of invest, um, of impact investment and um, uh, impact loans. Uh, so I will turn it over to Beth to uh, take us through a couple of uh, slides on uh, uh, what impact investment and impact loans are all about. Beth, please. Okay, and can, hopefully everyone can see my yep. screen. Yep. And I'll get rid of everyone there. Awesome. Um, good morning, everybody. I'll add my good wishes for everyone's uh, health and well-being. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. As Misha said, I have been working um, in and around impact investing for uh, many years. The, the, the term was not actually coined until 2009, but many of us were at it uh, for a long time uh, before that. Um, and uh, three years ago, I did come to the Jewish Community Foundation of San Diego to be the CEO, the president and CEO. Um, and, and one of the, uh, with, with the idea and that we would bring some innovation to the foundation and really bring impact investing to the Jewish world and bring some of the young people who are the millennials who are so taken with impact investing to the Jewish world. And so we have in San Diego brought out a number of impact investing opportunities um, for our donor advised fund holders. Um, I, uh, as a quick personal note, I am really driven to do this by the by our tradition, which really commands us to do this. I, I am very driven by Maimonides' uh, uh, highest level of tzedakah around uh, giving a, a a loan or an investment to help people uh, have you know become self sufficient, and that in, in many ways that's what impact investing is all about. I know. Um, that some of you on the call are already very knowledgeable of impact investing. Um, bear with me for a couple of minutes as we educate your colleagues and get everyone on the same page. Um, there is a, I would say, a broadly um, understood and accepted uh, a definition of impact investing um, from the, the Global Impact Investing Network known as the GIN. Um, and that is that impact investments are investments not grants, made with the intention to generate positive, measurable social or environmental impact alongside a financial return. And they can be made across asset classes and across many social impact areas. You know, we're, we're talking today primarily about, you know, nonprofit sector, which can be across many impact areas. There are three characteristics that it's really important to note are, that, that define every impact investment. And the first is intentionality that impact investments are made with the intention to uh, produce social or environmental uh, impact or solutions. Um, as you can see in the little picture there, it's intentional. It's not accidental impact, it's intentional impact. Um, and that's really what, that, that's part of what uh, distinguishes it from a traditional investment. Financial returns. Impact investments seek a financial return on capital. Now that can be just a return of capital, like a recoverable grant, all the way to a risk-adjusted market rate return. And that's what distinguishes impact investing from philanthropy. Um, and uh, 
I think it's important to just throw out there that when we talk about risk adjusted market rates of return, the, you know, the, obviously the traditional investment world is so much larger than the impact investment world that often we bring the traditional assessments of risk to non-traditional investments. And that is starting to change as we're seeing more and more ways to look at risk um, in different contexts, which then you know, alters what the risk adjusted market rate of return is. And finally, impact measurement. Um, every, an impact investor or uh, someone managing impact capital is committed to measuring and reporting on the social impact that they have. So Ogan, as you'll hear, you know, will tell you as they make loans uh, to nonprofits and, and also to small businesses, um, you know, they're going to tell you about the impact that those loans have. And that, that those three characteristics define an impact investment. To, to just take that a little bit further, just to make it clear what's a grant and comparing to an investment, I'm sure you're all super familiar with traditional grants. As a donor, you give dollars to a charity. The charity uses it for the prescribed purpose, assuming it's unrestricted, and you don't get any money back. And here on the slide, it says no money return to the donor advice fund, you know, the slide was created around uh, working with donor advice fund holders. Um, you know, and obviously in the case of a grant, all of the return is social return. Now a recoverable grant is very similar. It's just that it, it's the, the charity agrees to make its best effort to accomplish the purpose of the grant and then return some or all of the money. Um, there are no legal requirements. When it's a grant, it's a grant. You, you know, a recoverable grant is a best efforts um, undertaking. But if it's successful, then some or all of the grant is returned to the donor advised fund and then the account holder or the donor can re-grant it elsewhere. So you're getting, you know, a recycle. Now, obviously a traditional investment, those dollars are allocated to an investment purely for the purpose of making money. And all return is measured in financial return. And in the case of, a, of donor advised funds and in, in many in, in, in traditional investment houses, there's an investment committee that that has to go through as opposed to a grant that would be approved by a granting, you know, different fiduciary obligations. And finally, an impact investment kind of brings it all together. And those are do dollars that are allocated as an investment, but with the intention of social and financial impact and both of those impacts are measured. So the total return is a combination of social return and financial return. And finally, um, you'll see a whole spectrum of um, impact investments from grants and recoverable grants and fixed income, you know, all the way, you know, below market and then in the lighter blue, um, all the way to venture capital and, and public equities and things that are you know, generally highly risky, but also have uh, high returns. Um, Ogin, and what you're going to hear about today, there's an opportunity for grants um, around loan loss reserve, which you'll hear about. And then there's a fixed income investment, which, you know, think about fixed income investments. You are making a loan, you are getting interest payments, and then you're getting your funds back, and you're having an impact um, that is going to be described shortly. Um, as you're doing it. And so that that's the outline of um, impact investing. And I will just say that I am totally available to answer any questions, whether in this webinar or anybody is welcome to, to call me and email me. And I'm happy to hop on the phone and, and go deeper into this stuff with anyone, um, particularly in the Jewish community. So with that, I will turn it back to Misha and we will start to apply this to the specifics of Ogin and nonprofits in Israel. Thank you, Beth. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, Beth mentioned, she will be available, um, uh, and she is uh, one of our community's uh, most experienced and articulate experts uh, in the field. And speaking about articulate and experienced, um, I want to turn it over to uh, uh, my friend uh, Amir Aronovich, uh, who's uh, done every uh, job seemingly in the Jewish agency from uh, program to finance to strategy to being uh, a deputy CEO to uh, uh, making it to the top right at the time when we needed her 
um, Amir Aronovich, the Chief Executive Officer of the Jewish Agency for Israel. Uh, go ahead, Amir. Hello, and thank you, everyone. And yes, this is, uh, this is an expression of how weird things become these days when you manage things around the coronavirus uh, alongside the regular schedule. Um, I think um, what's, what's interesting to me is that I really feel at home in this kind of a discussion uh, because 23 years ago, my first role in the agency was actually to manage uh, loan funds to small businesses and social businesses uh, on behalf of the agency um, in a way where philanthropy is really um, uh, taking the role of mitigating the risk in, in some form or fashion of what you have mentioned, um, Beth. And uh, so this is something we've been doing for uh, over three decades in the agency, and therefore the uh, collaboration with Ogen uh, was a very natural to us. Um, I would also say that I had the privilege to be two years in Mandel and, and research the area of social impact investment, and I uh, fully identify with the huge opportunity, as you've described, uh, that there is here to, uh, to broaden and expand our ability to do good in the world in those more nuanced and sophisticated financial models. Um, in terms of, uh, yeah, just put it on a slide mode. I would appreciate, thanks. Um, in terms of, uh, of this current crisis, um, I would say when we talk about the uh, non-for-profit sector in Israel, we're talking about 16,000 non-for-profit organizations. Uh, those are the ones who are providing the most critical social services in Israel of all kinds. So uh, medical services, welfare, um, education, community, absorption, um, arts, culture, um, um, and the similar. And that sector actually employs 60% of Israel labor force. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people, which this is their source of income and, and the, the work they wake up every morning to. And when we talk about um, uh, the GDP, it's responsible for more than 6% of the GDP of Israel. Uh, when we look at those NGOs, uh, we, we find this sector, even prior to the uh, outbreak of the coronavirus, in a very sensitive and vulnerable situation, uh, mostly because uh, we have ended a year where we didn't have a government. So there wasn't any uh, budget of the government, and those NGOs are heavily relying on governmental funding, uh, paying um, for the services they're providing, actually, uh, the public sector. Um, in addition to uh, uh, quite a large uh, ratio of their income coming from donors and foundations. And then the last part, which is uh, the, the minority, is the, the income they generate themselves. So you can imagine that in a situation where there isn't a governmental budget, and now with the huge uncertainty um, as, as an implication of this crisis with regard to um, um, future don donations, um, that brings this sector in a youth crisis, you can see that already in 2018, uh, they were reporting 60, 63% of all of those known profits uh, were reporting um, they have a need to access credit. Uh, that amounts mainly because of the gap there is, even when the government is contracting and uh, providing payments for the services, there is a huge gap of time, sometimes between 12 months to 18 months until the government reimburses. And so those NGOs need the lifeline of, uh, of uh, cash flow uh, in order to um, uh, be able to provide those services until they're reimbursed. Um, definitely the outbreak of this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, has only increased the uncertainty. And therefore, uh, we understood that there is a youth problem. And if you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, when we think about an NGO and, and we think about those 16,000, so they're probably, they're, they're some of those who are very big and very experienced and have solid boards and management. Um, but also there are a lot of them that are uh, smaller, medium size, uh, not necessarily as stable and solid as the others. And the first thing that we have identified uh, working in this sector uh, together with Ogen is understanding that, that we need to take a holistic approach. And when we think of a CEO of such an NGO, when they wake up in the morning to such an um, environment in Riyam, there are many areas in which they need someone to hold their hands and help make sense of the situation. But there are issues around the cash flow needs and how do I uh, bridge that? There are issues about employing liabilities. How do I not get into um, a different complex legal situation 
uh, with my employee, with my uh, workers? Uh, do I send them out to a leave of absence? Do I keep them? Do I, do I lower their scale, et cetera? Um, what are the kind of critical capacities that, that I need to uh, maintain, be able to maintain so that I'm able to be there also um, as, as recovery starts and as the day after comes? Um, how do I work with my board? How do I maximize um, the ability of my board members and mobilize them to each bring their own value into the situation? Um, how do I analyze my situation vis-a-vis -vis the government? Where is it that it's only um, a gap of time until I see funding? When is it, where is it that I may um, have um, a contract being stopped? Um, how do I um, manage my conversations with my donors and foundations? Uh, where is it that I have commitments that maybe not uh, uh, be fulfilled and that are interested actually um, uh, to assist in emergency needs? And lastly, with regard to the kind of core uh, strategic capacity of the services, what kind of adjustment do I need to, uh, uh, to do to my services because the emergency needs actually uh, demand more services? Um, at the other hand, uh, what kind of new opportunities uh, may arise from the situation? So, when we think about those NGOs, um, enabling them to get a loan uh, for working capital kind of pitch this situation, that's only one piece of a broader approach. And we believe that many of them, prior to applying for the loan, it would make sense for them to get some, um, some help on this. And, and if you will create some kind of an emergency analysis of what would an 18 month plan look like, based on which then they can apply for a loan in our loan fund with Ogin, or apply for the um, government or maybe refinance uh, some of their um, um, existing uh, situation with the banks and some other partners. So this is where, and then you can go to my last slide. This is where um, the idea came up of, of uh, an initiative called Mentor, Menta O. In Hebrew, it's kind of playing between mentor and O, light. Uh, this is um, our, our desire to, to try to help and bring light uh, to the life of those very important NGOs. Um, and this is a, a joint venture collaboration between three organizations, the Jewish Agency for Israel, Keren Shemesh, which is part of the Ogan Group, and IBN Israel Venture Fund, to ask you to create a large network of hundreds of mentors, mentors coming from the business sector, coming from the NGO sector, and coming from the public sector, um, all who are willing to volunteer and hold the hands of those CEOs and work with those NGOs um, in kind of three different stages. Uh, the first is in this immediate due diligence uh, situation so that they can help those NGOs to create this 18-month um, emergency plan uh, based on which they can then uh, apply for a loan or, or apply for some other resources. Uh, but then as they start implement the loan and start to uh, walk their way during this crisis and the, towards the recovery period, they will keep on receiving mentoring. And we talk about both mentoring that would be a more generic one to work with the CEO, but also some very specific mentoring around, you know, um, how do I get my services to become more digital? How do I make um, uh, different changes in my workforce? We will have mentors which are specifically to some target areas and mentors which are more uh, gradually uh, uh, helping. But the important piece is that that would be done in a professional way. So we have all committed as partners to budget that creates a one-stop shop. Uh, we have just uh, um, um, hired a talent, very talented manager to pull this off and to be able to create a whole, what we say, kind of a whole um, um, work plan of what does it mean to be a mentor for such a, uh, an NGO. This is currently a service that in Israel, and how do we create those packages and arrangements where they suit the size of the NGO, the area of the NGO, and also have a training. There's going to be a formal training for each of the mentors so that they will take seriously their role and be committed to do that along, along the way. Now, this enabled us, the Jewish agency, to kind of collaborate um, in, in assisting the third sector in both ways, in this one-stop mentoring um, initiative, Menta'o, but also join the Ogan Loan Fund um, exactly in the way that we have been doing that philanthropy all through the years. And that is um, engaging our partners, communities and donors, in our case, um, JSNA and, and some of the biggest federations in North America, to actually become um, the, um, um, the source to mitigate the risk um, to the Ogan Loan Fund. And Sagi will um, 
detail more on that. So uh, we are proud uh, to uh, be part of this. Uh, we actually think this is the right way to act. We, the agency, just launched also an international loan fund of kind of a similar one to help communities at risk and community organizations that are collapsing around the world. And we are, um, we are strong believers um, in this kind of a solution alongside some additional solutions that, of course, are needed to address such a crisis. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Amira. Uh, we'll turn it over to uh, Sagi uh, in, in a second, who uh, I've worked with in a number of capacities, uh, from his being the founding director of Israel uh, Action, uh, Israel American Council, to uh, uh, some work on anti dolomitization of uh, uh, Israel, and now uh, in, in this new capacity. I want to uh, mention to everyone, uh, on your screens, uh, you have the Q&A uh, section. Please type in your questions to any of the uh, panelists or to the whole group as we go along so that we can begin to answer those questions towards the end. Uh, of the program. And with that, um, turning it over to Sagi Balasha, the CEO of the Elgin Group. Sagi. Thank you very much, Misha and Amira and everybody, and hi, everybody. Um, uh, at Elgin Social Loan Fund, we started to think about uh, helping NGOs with loans already a year ago in light of the government crisis. But when the Corona uh, or the COVID-19 outbreak started a month ago, we understood that uh, uh, many of the terms really changed and uh, um, we have to change them, to change the tracks in the, and, and we understood the risk is much higher we, that, we, that just a weeks ago it was. And therefore, um, uh, very quickly, we raised a philanthropic uh, mitigation cushion that enabled us to uh, um, provide those tracks that you see here uh, in this slide. And uh, a, a lot of this thanks to um, Amira and the Jewish Agency. So we are providing four tracks of loans. Three of the tracks um, are kind of bridge loans. Two tracks, the, the bridge loans against uh, agreements, government agreements. This is the least risky track because the government provides us with a kind of a guarantee. Um, the second one is a bridge loan against the government grant. Here it's also money from the government, but the government doesn't give any guarantee and they can um, cut this budget any, any given moment if they decide to and the risk is higher. The third type is bridge loans against private uh, uh, philanthropic grants. It's a donor that uh, gave a pledge and, and the pledge will come just in a few months or a year and the, and the organization can apply for a loan uh, and use the money until the donor give, give the money, um, actually give the money. The most uh, um, risky track here, as you can imagine, is the COVID-19 continued, continued operation loans. Those loans are against nothing, not against government allocation or future income, those loans are just to uh, save nonprofits from dying because of COVID-19, shutting down. Um, and an organization, an NGO comes, he requests for this type of loan. And what we do, uh, we are starting the mentorship program Amira just mentioned. We're doing a kind of a due diligence, a quick due diligence of uh, one week, not more. Uh, even before we start the mentoring, we check what is the stability or the, the survive, uh, surviving uh, um, chances of this NGO. And based on that, we give them a loan of up to 400,000 shekels. You can see, I will not um, go through all the terms, but you can see the amounts and, 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 and the other terms here. Um, the way we structure the fund, it's a two-tier capital structure. Um, the, uh, the tier above is a core lending capital, $10 million uh, that Ogen raised before the crisis and, and, and decided to allocate. The money comes from two type of sources. Uh, one source is impact loans, um, or what we call impact investments. The other source is grants. And uh, every foundation or a private donor can decide if you will give us the money as a grant or, a, or an impact loan. An impact loan is 
uh, as Beth mentioned, the, the Philanthropic Foundation just uh, deposits the money with Ogen, and Ogen, uh, um, and Ogen holds the money for five years or more. During this time, this money uh, um, is used to provide loans to nonprofits, um, make great impact, and then after five years, we are giving back to the foundation or to the private donor their money, and, so, and with some small and modest interest. Um, below the core lending capital, we have the risk mitigation capital, or what we call a safety net. That, uh, this is 20% of the money, is being there to absorb the risk. The risk is immense, especially now, and we anticipate the default rates may be high. And this money, which is only grants, will be the first money that we pay for the default, the anticipated default. Um, we were uh, uh, lucky enough uh, to uh, raise, I think in a week, $2 million uh, uh, to protect the $10 million that you see uh, above. 30% um, uh, thanks to the Jewish agency and the other thanks to Bob Gottesman, PEF and others. We have it on the call, the Shacha Foundation, which I need to mention, they were the first, we started, even before the crisis. Um, and uh, we really hope to be able to provide more. Here you can see some statistics we started this uh, project a month ago. The demand is very high. Uh, you can see that most uh, NGOs are requesting for the most risky track, the COVID-19 crisis track. It's uh, 34 applications um, that were uh, uh, submitted and the rest of the tracks are less popular. You can also see on the left side um, what is the proportion between types of NGOs. The biggest uh, part is education a NGO. You have here welfare. We can immediately understand that those nonprofits that we help are, uh, are serving the lowest population, the people, the poorest uh, layers in Israeli society. So the impact of helping nonprofits is direct impact. Of, uh, of the lowest deciles in the Israeli society. You see the, the average um, uh, size of a nonprofit that got a loan is uh, around two and a half million dollars, and an average loan is around $100,000. Uh, 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 here you can see the funnel since we started, where we are literally today. So we got so far, and I want to remind everybody that we only have 30 million shekels. You can see that even if we stop today, we already, the leads we got are almost are more than 20 million shekels. We got 21 million shekels in leads that were translated to 90, 17 million shekels in application to 9 million shekels discussion, 5 million shekels in approvals, and almost 5 million shekels in execution of real money that was sent. Now, probably a, a very big percentage of the application of the 17 million application will be two weeks from now execution and we we will quickly run out of money so we anticipate that the money uh, um, will uh, will finish uh, by the end of may beginning of june what is a huge challenge for us because the need uh, will be there and we our target is to double the size of this uh, of this um, uh, of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the loan fund, meaning extra $10 million for lending capital and $2 million for risk integration uh, fund. The way uh, to give, um, so if, you're, if you decide, you and your foundation decide to give to the core lending capital, you have uh, a few options. One option is just to give a regular grant um, uh, to organ American friends and you can get, get the tax deductible like any other grant. The other way is uh, to give an impact loan. If you are an American foundation, you have the, uh, the PRI. PRI is an amazing uh, American tax code existing only in America. You can give an impact loan and get the same tax benefits as if you, get, you, got, you, you gave a donation. Even though you will get your money back in five years, you'll get your tax deductible right now. 
an amazing way. Uh, we did that already with, uh, uh, with the Fisher and Russell Berry with Root Leadership are the second one to do a PRI with Organ. Um, and you are giving the money and we are paying you back and 1% on our interest, which is better than a CD. Now, what protects uh, the, your money here is the risk guarantee fund. And this, this is traditional, uh, uh, um, land, uh, traditional donation, give in any amount um, to protect the, the core lending capital. Um, important to say, according to the Israeli uh, law, uh, Ogin is limited to 29 impact loans, and therefore each impact loan has to be above one million dollars, uh, unless you are working with uh, the Jewish Communal Fund of New York. They, for them, we have the opportunity. We have very soon the opportunity to give an impact loan which is smaller than one million dollars. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sagi. Um, I very much appreciate uh, the presentation and the succinctness of, uh, of how you do it. Uh, everyone on the panel has a lot to say, and uh, I'm really uh, very grateful for you uh, uh, limiting yourself um, to just a few words. The one uh, piece I want to add to uh, Sagi's presentation is that while the risk mitigation fund for this program um, is a 20 percent, um, which is uh, uh, quite high, uh, given that the history of uh, uh, loans that have been uh, offered and collected uh, from uh, those in need, uh, both nonprofits and small businesses, uh, historically has been under 1% uh, default rate. And it's because it was no guarantees uh, that 20% was uh, um, the cushion that was, that was sought for, for, for this project. Um, and I know that uh, the Gottesman uh, uh, Foundation has... Uh, uh, contributed both to the um, mitigation uh, fund as well as uh, uh, capital. And uh, I want to turn it quickly over to uh, Ruth Saltzman. Uh, uh, Russell Berry Foundation has been an innovator in a variety of ways um, in, in Israel uh, over the years. And here yet again, um, they've stepped up in a very, very quick fashion to uh, um, help uh, launch uh, this fund and to work with uh, Ogan and the Jewish Agency. Ruth, please uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and share the good wishes for people's health and safety at this very difficult time. So I'll share my screen in a moment, but I think it is worthwhile just to give a little, uh, a little bit of introduction to say that prior to my position at the Russell Berry Foundation in philanthropy, uh, the previous 25 years had been spent as a banker and particularly I worked at a bank you may have heard of, Chase, uh, working in the community development field and have a great deal of familiarity as a lender in doing exactly the kind of lending that you've heard about today. And what I'd like to emphasize more than anything else is that the situations and the remedies that are being talked about here are very tested. That the, as much as this sounds like it is new and exciting and innovative, and it is, the uh, need to provide access to capital for nonprofits to bridge their sources of revenue and the need to provide the kind of accompanying services that Amira spoke about are very, very tested approaches and very successful approaches. So when an opportunity came to participate, this was not, uh, you know, new territory and was not unfamiliar. It was, but of course, thank God it's finally available. So let me now. And So who are we? Uh, the Russell Berry Foundation is a mid-sized private foundation in Teaneck, New Jersey. We have, broadly speaking, two domains of granting. We tend to refer to it internally as Israel and non-Israel, which uh, is a little clunky, so I 
came up uh, with different language here, but our major areas of granting are our local northern New Jersey community, diabetes research treatment and prevention, and interfaith bridge building, which is about 55% of our granting. But we are very significant, long-standing, and serious grantors in Israel, 45% uh, roughly of uh, our granting over the last five years. Uh, and we are active in four domains, one of which is strengthening municipal and regional capacity, Jerusalem, developing the north of the country, and Jewish identity and pluralism. I say this because it is important to understand the lens with which not only I personally, but the uh, way in which the foundation, the Russell Berry Foundation looked at what it is that Ogan represented and what I would like to, uh, and, and how it meets needs we were interested in. And I think it is useful here to say that we were in fact looking at a PRI for Ogan before the emergency. And it was the, uh, opportunity to work on developing the North, for example, that was quite material to what got our interest. And the statement that I would like to put in front of you is that investing in Ogin made a great deal of sense before the pandemic, because there are large unmet needs for credit in small businesses and for first time ho home buyers that retard economic development. And we are a foundation that, you know, we give quite significantly to philanthropic purposes, but we have a real entrepreneurial DNA. And we understood that if we are trying to promote the economic development of the North, the economic success of Jerusalem, that credit and unmet credit needs are very much part of the story. We became aware of the severe cash flow pressure on nonprofits, on the NGOs, because of the lack of government budget that was referred to earlier in this webinar, when some of our grantees asked us whether we would be willing to lend to them as a way of getting them cash ahead of uh, when our, our uh, grant payments might be due. And then of course, enter COVID-19 and uh, everything that was already in fragile condition and everything that was already difficult was multiplied by 10. And happily, you know, our board was very receptive and in January agreed to provide a $1 million PRI to Ogin uh, and to do so into the core lending. Um, I think that, you know, based on as I mentioned a moment ago, based on a lot of years of experience that I've had uh, domestically in the US as a, as a banker, as well as for the last dozen years from the position of uh, working with the Russell Berry Foundation and all of their efforts and all of the ways they support the NGO sector in Israel, NGOs are not sufficiently appreciated as critical infrastructure, particularly for, for high need populations. And I think that now in the time of COVID-19, when all of a sudden we're seeing how apparent it is that without what NGOs do, that there are segments of society that are just completely left uh, without services, without help, without information, without what they need in order to make it through in a tremendously difficult time. Secondly, as Amira was speaking about, handing NGOs money is important, providing them that access to credit, that bridge loan is important. Doing it within the context of handholding technical assistance is so much more effective. And so I will close by saying that, I, you know, I certainly invite others uh, both on this webinar and within your circles to recognize that philanthropy can provide the resources and the flexibility that are so necessary to this endeavor and are needed now more than ever. Thank you, Ruth, and thank you uh, to all of the panelists. We have uh, a bit of time uh, for uh, answering questions. Please, uh, uh, type them uh, into the Q&A 
um, area on uh, on your screens or, or to chat. They can go to everybody um, on the uh, on the panel or to uh, any any individual. Uh, before we start answering, and we have a couple of questions already, um, I just wanted to briefly mention and not go into it very much that you know this particular uh, webinar was focused on uh, the help that was needed for Amutot, for the non-for-profits uh, in Israel in that program. Uh, but there is, of course, another uh, a couple of areas. One is help for small businesses. Um, which are uh, have always been in, in dire need of affordable credit um, that uh, hasn't been uh, readily available. Um, and the other is uh, uh, help for some individuals uh, is through a uh, um, free loan uh, program. Now, the government of Israel has tried to address this small business uh, area They've introduced some programs, but uh, to date, uh, those programs have uh, uh, had a lot of problems and a lot of issues, and they're really not functioning uh, uh, in the way that uh, one would hope. Uh, um, between the banks and the government, there are lots of issues, so uh, that solution has not, uh, at least not yet, uh, has been working while the needs are very dire now, and uh, um, I know that Ogan and uh, uh, others are working very hard on uh, developing solutions, and there are some solutions already in place. And we may have another webinar, um, uh, possibly dedicated specifically to to that issue. Um, uh, don't want to spend uh, more time on this right now, but but it is an issue. It is something that uh, is being addressed and needs to be addressed uh, um, in in short order. Um, so I'm going to go to some questions here we have uh, for the panel. Um, uh, the uh, first question um, uh, asks, is if you give less than one million through Jewish communal fund um, uh, or through another uh, 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 donor-advised fund possibly, uh, is the uh, um, program-related investment PRI tax deduction still relevant? Um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Sagi to uh, to address that uh, very quickly and others to chime in uh, I if think necessary. Beth can, uh, I, can, I think Beth can give a better answer. Yeah. Great. Beth? Uh, yeah. Uh, donor advised funds don't have the 5% payout requirement that private foundations have. So the PRI isn't relevant, but when you put money into your donor advised fund, you are taking that tax deduction. Um, so you're still, you're, you're getting the tax deduction for making the donation, um, but the, the PRI piece does, does not apply because there's no, uh, there's no payout ratio required of a donor advised fund holder. Happy to talk more about that offline. Um, the Jewish Community Foundation in San Diego could facilitate this as well if you're interested. Uh, uh, thank you, Beth. Um, in addition, I just uh, uh, wanted to, uh, to mention that the way to provide uh, either the grants or the impact loans uh, for this program could be done directly uh, through Israel for those uh, donor advice funds that have that uh, capacity or through the American Friends Organization in the United States, which can uh, also uh, manage this. Uh, the next uh, uh, question uh, comes from... T t just, uh, 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 Misha, yeah. if I could add here. Please, please. Um, they, uh, funders can also use uh, the new donor advice fund that uh, Jeff N has... Uh, has been creating in uh, Israel. Uh, by that process, uh, this is actually particularly good for um, for people to want to contribute to the loan guarantees because the funds that are deposited in the donor advice fund in Israel, I'm talking about the donor advice fund in Israel, not an American TAF, can be counted towards loan guarantees. So if somebody's interested in that mechanism, um, we can take it with uh, Maya Natan of Line and, and, and uh, explain it more in depth. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. 
Um, uh, next question comes from uh, Martin Fleischmann. Hi, Martin. Um, how are you determining who to support? Are you seeing scenarios of NGOs folding and merging in order to get uh, our support? I, um, I'm willing to uh, try to answer that, to address that. Um, regarding between uh, two parts, Martin, um, how do we decide on a specific case of a loan application? There is a credit committee um, the NGO has to submit kind of a shortened business plan. Um, the credit committee um, asks for additional information if they need, and then the decision is uh, made for the loan. But your broader question, I think, is a more important one. And I think you're totally right to bring it up because we understand that um, in this current moment, uh, this is a crisis, but it's not necessarily that the way it would come out of the crisis is that it would stay the same or need to stay the same. These kind of crises are an opportunity to kind of uh, reanalyze and reevaluate what would a new kind of a balance in this market look like. Um, and then mergers and, and folding um, off of some of the NGOs is something that is quite natural. And actually, I think this is a more strategic conversation uh, that is interesting to have among the biggest players in the third sector in Israel. And uh, we just started such a conversation. Uh, actually, yesterday we had a first kind of a initial brainstorming between the three biggest uh, social players in the Israeli society, which is JDC Israel, Rashi Foundation, and the Jewish Agency. Um, not not uh, because we're three women leaders, but maybe, maybe also because of that. Uh, we were quite quickly uh, outreaching to one another and uh, met with our uh, strategy people. And uh, there was a very, very productive and kind of a vital, vibrant conversation yesterday and we all agree that this is maybe the most critical um, next step that has to be done. And now we're, we're trying to consider, you know, who should be around the table in order to, to try to right. help and map and analyze uh, what would be different possible scenarios uh, for this, maybe in different sectors of the NGO sector in Israel, and uh, how do you best uh, kind of uh, uh, prepare? Thank and, you, Amira. Uh, Thank you very much. I'm sorry to, to jump in, but we only have two minutes left. Uh, I want to um, say one thing and then uh, um, we'll conclude. Uh, there are a couple of questions about whether uh, Arab-led uh, or Arab NGOs are eligible uh, for the program. I, I can tell you that the very first loan, actually, that came out of Ogan under this program was to uh, an Arab uh, organization. So the answer is yes, and you can... Uh, pursue the conversation with Sagi um, uh, afterwards. Uh, there are a couple of other very important questions that came in about what is the most impactful idea that you know of to help that is either not being maximized or not being done. I think Amira began to outline uh, um, that, uh, that issue. And uh, again, uh, you can follow up with her. I want to emphasize that everybody on this call um, is... Uh, uh, going to be available to answer questions that are uh, both general and specific um, about this program and the issues that uh, uh, NGOs face um, uh, face in Israel and the details about how to uh, proceed. But I also want to emphasize that what is needed right now for this program are two things. Um, grants that will uh, increase uh, the risk mitigation uh, fund, which uh, needs to be at 20% of lending, and impact loan capital um, uh, that comes from foundations and donors uh, payable within five years at 1% to the, to the lender in order to increase uh, the original 30 million shekel uh, fund, which will be exhausted within a month. Um, or sooner, given uh, how much use uh, it is getting. I want to thank, uh, again, JFN, um, Andres, and Tamar, and Maya, Natan, and Israel for pulling this together. Um, and wish everyone to stay um, healthy and safe in, in this environment. And uh, please let us know if you have any further questions or would like to follow up with anyone um, uh, who was uh, uh, on this uh, uh, on this webinar? Tamar. Thank you, Misha, and thank you to all of the panelists for all this important information. 
I want to encourage, just like Misha said, if you have any more questions, you can always reach out to any of the panelists. If you need help connecting to them, you can reach me at Tamar at jfunders.org. Also check out our website at jfunders.org. We have so many different programs going on in the next few weeks, and we would love for you to join more of our different conversations, many related to COVID-19 and how we can be impactful in our philanthropy to help out during this crisis. Um, so goodbye for now, and I wish you all, um, wish you all safety and health and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.